welcome everyone to today uh, to the first payoff seminar of the spring uh, 2020 semester. Um, today, our first seminar is given by our own uh, Dr. Michael French. Uh, so I wanted to just say a few words about Michael. Uh, I probably brought this in any introduction, but just to remind you, uh, he arrived here at SOMAS in uh, I believe January 2015. Um, he, uh, in terms of his background, he got his uh, bachelor's degree in atmospheric science at uh, Cornell University. Uh, then he went over to the University of Oklahoma uh, and worked and got his master's and PhD there in uh, meteorology, uh, working with uh, uh, Howie Bluestein. Uh, as you'll see here, a lot of Michael's background is using um, mobile radars to understand severe storms, in particular tornadoes. And so that's a lot of what Michael's uh, been doing. After his PhD, he had a postdoc at the National Severe Storms Laboratory and also at the Cooperative Institute for Business Scale Studies, both there in uh, Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma. And then, uh, then he came over and joined us in, uh, in 2015. So let's welcome Michael. He'll be talking about some of his uh, work here and, and, and using the radars. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, yeah, so as Brian mentioned, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about uh, the various topics that I've been working on uh, a little bit before I got here and then what I've been really focusing in on since I've gotten here. And uh, it can really be boiled down to using severe storms observations to better um, use, uh, using radar observations to better understand severe storms. So uh, severe storms and radars, this is the kind of big umbrella uh, severe storms have a, lo a lot of different hazards associated with them. Usually, uh, the main ones are hail, uh, winds, and tornadoes. So my primary intellectual interest is in tornadoes. Uh, here's a picture of one I took in 2009. Um, why might someone be interested in tornadoes? It perhaps is self-evident, but if not, uh, tornadoes are responsible just in the past 10 years for over a thousand deaths in the U.S. and several billion dollars worth of damage. So here's an image of, of some damage, a picture I took after uh, a damaging tornado in 2011. In addition, there's obviously a, a meteorological uh, impact here. So it's not just that tornadoes affect people and property. It's there's a lot scientifically that isn't very well understood. So here's a radar image. I'm going to be showing a lot of these. So this is reflectivity. This is related to can think about it as, as how heavy the precipitation is on the left. And on the right is uh, the radial velocity that gives us a component, one component of the wind, horizontal wind, towards or away from the radar. So right here you can see uh, greens next to reds. That means that there's a lot of cyclonic shear and uh, perhaps in indicative that there might be a tornado. Uh, I showed this image, however, because there actually was not a tornado in this storm. Um, if you were a forecaster, you might think that there would be. So it's really hard to know which storms are going to produce tornadoes and which aren't. That's in addition to the fact that tornadoes, are rel in terms of meteorology, uh, meteorological scales, are, are very small. Uh, typical diameter is about 300 meters. So that's big to us, but it's hard to observe, uh, to, to observe them, especially when you don't know when they're going to form. So we don't know a lot about their structure, how they evolve, and when they're going to form, which obviously is, is a huge issue for, for operational forecasters. So if we want to get really high quality data of tornadoes and try to better understand them structurally from, from, a, from a basic research point of view, um, it'd be nice to have really high quality radar data. Um, our main tool is our operational nationwide network of radars. These are the, this is called the WSR 88D network. There's about uh, 160 of them. Uh, nationwide. The problem is they're fixed site, they're stationary, and if you want to collect really high quality data, you would need a tornado to form and move really close to one of them. Um, that typically doesn't happen. So what we do is we put radars on trucks and we bring the radar to the storm. So uh, here's a, a picture I took of a radar I was operating uh, in 2009 and 2010. And, uh, the foreground here and in the background is a tornado. So collecting data, really high quality data of, of tornadoes. And when you do that, 
you get some spectacular images, and you really start to understand their structure a lot better. Here's an image of a tornado. Uh, the tornado is actually right here in the middle, where there's no return from the radar. That's because the tornado has centrifuged out all the precipitation and debris. And these range rings are about 100 meters, so again, a very small scale, and it takes a lot of effort to collect this type of data. So the point here is that the best way, or I would argue the best way to learn about tornado structure and evolution and all the nitty-gritty details about tornadoes is to use mobile Doppler radars. <clears throat> Something I left out is that this has actually been done now for 25 years, uh, since the mid to late 1990s. And hundreds of tornadoes have been observed, uh, several hundred with these systems. So a very fair question to ask is, is there really anything left to learn using these types of systems? Um, so fortunately, in the past 10 years, two more advanced radar technologies have gained widespread, affordable use in storm and tornado observations uh, that weren't initially used. So the, the idea behind these technologies has been known for many years. Just implementing them has been rather expensive. So the two technologies are called phased array radar and dual polarization radar, and that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, so if we, we go through them individually, you can think about phased array uh, radar just very, um, in, in a very simple manner as just scanning really fast. I'm going to use the term rapid scan a lot. So uh, a phased array radar is able to steer uh, the radar beam electronically instead of mechanically. And assuming you have enough independent samples, you can get really high quality data, um, but at much faster update times. So a mobile phased array radar can get a volume of the atmosphere every 5 to 10, maybe 15 or 20 seconds, whereas a typical mobile radar is collecting that data about every two or three minutes. And our nationwide network of radars is collecting it every five to seven minutes. So a huge difference in time scale orders of magnitude we're talking about. A phased array radar can just scan faster. Dual polarization radar is a very different technology. That provides us with the ability to, uh, so we're collecting data are being collected in two polarization planes. And so this provides us additional information about um, characteristics of the hydrometeors that, that the radar is sampling. So it's not just, it's raining hard. We can get a better idea of, are we looking at rain? Are we looking at hail? Are we looking at ice crystals? Uh, are we looking, at, in fact, at tornado debris? So dual polarization allows us to get more information about what types of hydrometeors we're actually uh, looking at. All right, so here's an example for why phased array, our, our fast scanning radar systems, is so advantageous. This is just a comparison of the same tornado on the right is using the mobile radar. On the left is our operational network of radars. And so you can see this is updating about every five minutes. This is updating every six seconds. So you can, pretty easy to pick out where the tornado is, towards, away, uh, the cyclonic rotation. And you can see all the additional detail we can get and how we might be able to track additional tornado processes by just having this type of data as opposed to this on the left. All right, so that's why we love phased array radar. So what has been learned using phased array radar? Uh, has it really taught us anything? Uh, I would argue yes. I'm probably a little biased. But here's some work I did for my PhD, where uh, this is just a time series, and each dot represents the height uh, at, at, at that height level when the tornado was first identified. And so as we go forward in time, you see that we first see the tornado at higher and higher heights. In other words, you can view this as, as these data providing evidence that the tornado was forming first near the ground and then higher up. Uh, at later times. In other words, um, the tornado was forming bottom up. This actually was a pretty big breakthrough because for years it had been proposed that tornadoes descended to the surface from aloft. Uh, subsequent work in the past, uh, even the past year, has largely confirmed these findings. And um, I, there was a lot of media talk about it, and I learned that I should probably promote myself better. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's OK. OK, what else has been learned? Um, I also looked at tornado dissipation. So this is a, from a paper I wrote in 2014. And we found, um, so each one of these dots is a tornado observation in height versus time. They're color coded by intensity. And so where the dots stop is where there's no longer a tornado. It's when the tornado dissipated. And what we found was actually really shocking, which is that the tornado didn't dissipate first aloft or at the ground or at the same time at all height levels. It dissipated first in the middle at about 1.7 kilometers. 
uh, we subsequently found that the tornado was moving in radically different directions at different heights. And the inflection point was right here at about one and a half kilometers. And so I had some uh, hypotheses about why that is, which is beyond the scope of this talk. But um, again, uh, subsequent observations have, have also found this in, in a couple of additional cases that, that maybe tornadoes dissipate first in a one and a half to two kilometer layer. So basically, you have these new tools, and you observe things, and, and you see things that you never expected. OK, and so here's a picture of a dissipating tornado, and they take on these weird contorted shapes. And OK, well, maybe, maybe this is why. Because right here at cloud level, the tornado's gone. All right. Uh, so that's the type of thing that we've learned from phase ray radar. What about dual pole radars? What has been learned? Um, all right, so we have these. So here's our vertical versus horizontal plane. And you can see what we're, what we're doing is we're getting power back from both polarization planes. And so this can tell us something about uh, the shape and the size of, of the particle. And that can tell us something about I, what we think maybe what type of precipitation type it is. And so we can use that to develop what's known as a hydrometeor classification algorithm, which is very common now. And um, that can tell us, for example, red here is rain, the dark red is heavy rain, uh, the blue is biological scatterers. So we can get a, at least a guess, and this isn't 100% correct, but we can at least get a guess as to what actually we're looking at. That's really important if you're looking, for example, at whether there's, in a storm, there's uh, really heavy rain or hail. Right? It's a big difference in terms of impacts. Or um, when you have uh, a mix of snow and rain, or sleet, and freezing rain, that type of thing. So dual pole radar allows us to learn a lot when it comes to that. So uh, I'm going to be talking about some radar variables that come about because of uh, dual polarization uh, efforts in radars. So I'm going to just very briefly talk about what the, the, the two variables I'm going to talk about today. There are ZDR and ROHV. So ZDR you can think about as essentially a comparison of the power that's being returned in the horizontal versus the vertical. And it's the log value of it. So if you're getting more power back in the horizontal plane than the vertical, ZH is going to be greater than ZB, and ZDR is going to be greater than zero. So if you think about a spherical particle where you would expect equal return in horizontal versus vertical, they'd be the same, and your ZDR would be about zero. But if you had an oblate particle right, uh, that was flattened out, you might expect more return in the horizontal than the vertical, and your ZDR would be greater than zero. So you can see how this is related to hydrometeor shape. Important for this talk is that we know a little something about what happens to the shape of raindrops as they get larger. When they're smaller, they're more spherical. As they get larger, they flatten out. And so we would expect uh, smaller drops maybe to have ZDRs closer to zero, spherical, while larger drops would have positive ZDR values. So in other words, ZDRs also can be related to uh, raindrop size. In addition, rho HV, this is a correlation coefficient at lag zero. Uh, you can think about this as a measure within a radar volume of the, the heterogeneity of scatterers. In other words, if you have a radar volume and it's just filled with rain, your rho HV is going to be close to 1. If, however, you have a mix of precepts, say rain and snow, it's going to be lower, maybe 0.85 or 0.9 or 0.93. <coughs> if you have non-meteorological scatterers, say tornado debris, it's going to be all over the place uh, because the orientations and the sizes and the shapes of all your uh, particles are so different, your rho HV is going to be probably less than 0.8. So this tells us something about, again, about what we're looking at within a radar volume. Okay, so this is courtesy of Matt Cumgen at Penn State. You can imagine all these, imagine these are all spherical and their ZDR is zero on the left and the same on the right, except uh, in this volume, um, some are prolate, some are oblate, but they average out to be about zero it, within the volume. So left and right, ZDR is zero. But on the left, the rho HV is 1 because all the particles are, are basically raindrops. And on the right, we have a mix of uh, you know, different, uh, some frozen particles, some liquid particles, some unfortunate tornado debris. And your rho HV is much less than 1. All right, so why, why use dual pole radars uh, to look at, at tornadoes? Um, well, in supercells, and supercells are long-lived convective storms. They rotate, and they're responsible for 95% of the strongest tornadoes. 
So when I look at, when I talk about uh, storms, I'm really talking about supercell thunderstorms, our particular uh, subclass of, of, of storms. What we found with these uh, dual fold radars is that we kept seeing in, in, in these variables that I talked about, ZDR and RHV and some others, we saw repeatable signatures that we otherwise, without this type of technology, wouldn't have known they were there. So here's a few of the ones I'm going to talk about today or uh, some you may have even heard of. The tornadic debris signature, which I alluded to before. Tornado picks up a lot of debris. That's not rain. That's not snow. It has all different orientations. And it has really low rho HV. So forecasters now can see in real time a lot of times when a tornado is inflicting uh, damage uh, and debris. And so it's, it's very easy to say, or much simpler than it used to be to say, yes, there's definitely a tornado there. Uh, there's also a ZDR column. So this is when uh, the storm is lofting uh, raindrops and small hail above the freezing level. Right? You have really strong rising air and supercells, and it's lofting uh, the super cold water above the freezing level. So everywhere above the freezing level, it's dry snow. And then in this one area, you have some rain and hail. We know that's where the updraft is. So it's actually really powerful to be able to look at the ZDR column and say, yeah, that's where our storm is, our storm updraft is. Excuse me. And then the ZDR arc, um, that's just this area of enhanced ZDR along uh, one flank of the storm. And that's caused by size sorting, differential sedimentation whereby the larger drops are staying closer to the storm updraft, whereas smaller drops, uh, they have a, uh, a smaller terminal velocity, so they're not falling to the ground as fast, and they have more time to be taken into other parts of the storm. And so it's been shown that this EDR arc is actually related to um, a measure of vertical wind shear that's important for the development of tornadoes. So I'll, I'll get back to that. So uh, big picture, they, we see these repeatable signatures and, and supercells. In addition, we can use uh, dual pole radar to at least estimate the bulk quantities in terms of drop size distributions. Uh, I worked on a project where we tried to put distrometers in the path of storms. It did not go well. They all got destroyed. So uh, an, al an alternative, uh, not nearly as powerful, is to estimate drop sizes using uh, dual pole radar, using the kind of the techniques I mentioned before, where we know the smaller drops are going to be spherical and the larger drops are going to be oblate, and so we can use ZDR as an estimate of the median drop size in a radar volume. Okay, so that's great. We have these signatures, we have these DSDs, but what does it matter? Well, it matters because um, I like to think of uh, you know, the, the end resulting drop size distribution, and these signatures, they are resulting from some type of dynamical and or microphysical process. And, that, and those processes might be important for uh, storm and tornado development and evolution. So here's a, 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 a figure here. Here's where the tornado is. You can think about the orange as the large drops, the green as the smaller drops. And so some studies have been shown that, that maybe if, um, we can use the sizes of drops to infer something about whether a storm is going to produce a tornado. I'm going to talk about that. All right, so what has been learned? Um, so here's some work I did as a postdoc. Uh, and I, I had uh, some, fr some previous work had motivated the idea that maybe storms that produce tornadoes had different size drops than storms that did not produce tornadoes. So on the left is a, uh, so these are reflectivity, uh, and so ZHCDR scatter plots. You can think of the points above this line as big drops, uh, points below this line as small drops. And on the left is a tornadic case, and on the right is a non tornadic case, and this was kind of typical of what I found which is that in the tornadic cases, we had a lot of small raindrops. And in the non-tornadic cases, we didn't. Um, problem here was sample size, only 15 cases total that we looked at for mobile radars. Collecting mobile radar data of tornadoes is hard. All right, so sample sizes are often low. In addition, in one measly case, uh, I found that the drop sizes got very small in the 10 minutes leading up to tornado formation. Um, and this was consistent with the idea that tornadic storms would have smaller drops. Um, so I'll give you the hypothesis of why that is a little bit later. Um, but so it was you know, a, a potential here for something really illuminating, which is, wow, maybe if the drop sizes are getting smaller, that, that's an indication that, that the storm might produce a tornado. But again, one case. So you can't really go too crazy about it. All right, so this is all great. So what's the problem? We've learned a lot about tornado processes um, from these radars. What I haven't talked too much about is the R2O possibilities here. 
I've talked a lot about kind of basic research questions. But a lot of what I've talked about, if you think about it, wow, that could be really powerful for a forecaster to use this type of information to inform the severe warning, tornado warning process, if we feel confident that these are real signals. And that's where the problem comes in. Because all of these results I've shown you, every single one so far, is based on individual or maybe looking at two or three or half a dozen cases. And so we can't, there's a thousand tornadoes in the US per year, give or take. And so there's a few thousand supercells. And I'm looking at one or two cases. Right? We're not able to generalize the observations that have been made so far to a large population of cases. Number two, everything I've showed you so far is based on using mobile radars. Forecasters do not have access to mobile radars. They have access to our operational radar network. So the types of things that I see in our mobile radar data, they may not be able to see. So um, my career, kind of before I got here, was mainly interested in basic research. And when I got here, I said, you know, it's been, now it's been almost 25 years. I think it's about time we work to translate uh, the observations we've made with mobile radars to uh, the operational process, if at all possible. So I would argue that it's time to take a climatological approach. And in severe storms, every time that a large-scale climatology, there's been some introduction of new type of observing, uh, observing system, has come about, there's been uh, great strides made in, in, in the science. So um, after we got mobile radars, there was a climatology done about 10 years later, work by Curtis Alexander. And he found some stunning things, mainly like our tornado intensity um, climatology is probably really bad. And he was the first to find out or, or discover that tornadoes were, didn't really seem to be descending to the surface. But he lacked the data to really go further than that. Um, ideally, however, uh, again, that's a tool that forecasters don't have access to. So doing a climatology with tools that forecasters actually use would be even more beneficial. And there's a precedent for that, too, uh, when people started to look at hundreds and hundreds of soundings and see the environmental data near supercells. And they found out things like, yeah, actually, there are different environments when storms produce tornadoes versus when they don't. So that's the most powerful when you can do that. So what I've been working on over the past uh, couple of years is developing a dual polarization radar climatology of supercells. And that's because our operational radar network, thankfully, was in 2013 upgraded to these dual polarization capabilities, which is really great. So now, however, there's been six or seven years of high quality data that have been collected. And remember, I said it's about 1,000 tornadoes in the US per year. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of possible cases to look at instead of just one or two or three cases. We can also combine that with RAP data and even bring in storm environments. Uh, again, some information that, that forecasters always uh, also have. So uh, we developed a project that's aimed at answering several basic research, but also R2O, research operation type questions. Uh, what are dual pole differences between tornadic and non-tornadic supercells? Uh, what are their near, near storm environmental conditions? How do they influence what we see? Uh, how do they change during tornado processes? And what actually, if anything, can be used in the forecasting or now casting process? Okay, so in terms of results, I'll be focusing in on one and three today in terms of where we are. A big part of this was case selection. Um, so ideally, we're going to, for any individual problem we want to try to solve or answer, a question we want to answer, is to analyze a large number of storms, a large number of cases that are close to the radar with continuous data. Okay, so the large number is obvious. We want, the whole point of this is to get large sample sizes so we can generalize results. Why close to the radar? Well, two reasons. One, radars, uh, radar beams spread. So the farther that the storm is from the radar, the worse the detail is, the spatial detail. So we'd like to be close to have better, high, higher quality data. And number two, the radar beam is tilted at an elevation. So the closer you are, the closer to the ground you can look. So we chose 60 kilometers. That allowed the spatial resolution to be OK and also meant that we were looking at least in the lowest 500 meters, at a, at a 500 meter level for all the cases. Um, and since tornadoes are inflicting damage very close to the ground, the closer we can have data to the ground, the better uh, we can understand how they actually operate. Why continuous data? 
Well, you'll see in a second, but we want to see in a storm how it's changing from one volume to the next. All right? uh, our operational network collects a volume scan every five to seven minutes. And so we wanted four consecutive volumes at least so we could track how the, the supercell or, or the tornado was changing in time so that forecasters might be able to use that information uh, potentially in the warning process. So um, we wanted to look at both tornadic supercells and non-tornadic to compare them. So tornadic wasn't too difficult picking out cases. So the orange here are, is uh, March through August of 2015, the orange are supercell report, uh, tornado reports. And so it's, it's pretty easy to, uh, and, and the, the radars are the black dots with the 60 kilometer range ring. So it was very easy to just query a database and say, give me all the tornadoes that formed within 60 kilometers of one of these radars. And then we could look at them and say, OK, that's a supercell or that's not a supercell, which if, if you work in severe storms, is not terribly difficult. Uh, Non-tornadic was a little bit harder. Uh, we kind of lucked out. And that's because the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, uh, on a separate project in 2015, logged every single convective storm in the US. That's crazy. Uh, and they included what the storm mode was, so including supercell. So we were able to use that database and look at only supercells that did not have a tornado report associated with them. So we kind of looked out there. So we're starting with hundreds and hundreds of tornadic cases and hundreds and hundreds of non-tornadic cases. Um, and so here, what I'm showing is just a subset of 2015 tornadic supercells. And you can see why we want to look at all of these different cases because they all look really different. These are all supercells. These all produced a tornado. And yet um, their structure, their orientation, how large they are, and what direction they were moving are all very different. Right? I just chose these 15 at random. So you can see why we want to do this. Because not all, th these are very complex systems. And they all behave differently. And um, you really need a large sample to, to really start to try and understand them. Another really uh, key aspect of this climatology is uh, data quality. I talked to you about that variable ZDR, which is really important in this study. Uh, unfortunately, it's subject to differential attenuation, which isn't too big of a deal with this radar system because of its, it, its frequency, but also biases. And biases are really, really hard to deal with. And so what we did was kind of exhaustive, but we emulated what the Radar Operations Center in Norman does which there's several different ways to make sure your ZDR is accurate and use some type of bias correction. Uh, what they do is they use three methods. They weight them, and they average them. So they use a light rain, dry snow, brag scatter approach. I'm not going to get into how this works. It's beyond the scope of this, this talk. And then we ran the bias for every case individually. Um, this is hundreds and hundreds of hours of processing time. So each case is run for plus or minus 48 hours to make sure our ZDR data are high quality, or else there's no point in doing this entire exercise. All right, so what are some of, we have this great climatology, let's use it. So our first objective, or my first objective, is I wanted to look at tornado dissipation. Uh, you get really frustrated with saying, it's really hard to predict when a tornado is going to form. I've had this idea for a long time, kind of bouncing around in my head. Maybe it's a lot easier or maybe it's possible to predict when a tornado may dissipate, because you already have the tornado in your radar data. Maybe you can track how that tornado is behaving and associate those behaviors with impending dissipation. So are there tornado behaviors that occur prior to a tornado dissipating? Well, so we went back and looked through many, many case studies and found that there are. The first one is obvious. That's um, that the tornado is going to weaken before it dissipates. This is kind of self-evident. You don't just go from a violent tornado to nothing in a matter of seconds. <laughs> it undergoes a type of dissipation phase where it gets weaker and then it dissipates. All right, so here's just the life cycle of a tornado. And you can see the colors go from bright blue and yellow down to uh, white and, and light yellow and green. And so this is the tornado. And it's strong. It's strong. Uh, it makes a beeline off towards the south-southeast here. And it, it starts gets weaker, and then it dissipates. Second behavior is storm relative motion change. So it's been seen in a couple of case studies that relative to the storm, the tornado moves rearward when it's going to dissipate. Uh, and, and it's thought that this means uh, the tornado is being removed from 
uh, air that's rich in what we call vertical vorticity that allows the tornado to ma maintain itself. Um, but so the idea is that maybe storm relative motion rearward means the tornado is going to dissipate. A third behavior is tornado tilt. Uh, so this is, again, a paper I wrote in 2014 where we found that uh, one of the tornadoes that we observed became very heavily tilted in the vertical right before, in, in the minutes leading up to its dissipation. Uh, and of course, um, visual observations have told us for years that dissipating tornadoes take on this, these very highly contorted uh, shapes. Right? So that's also consistent with them becoming very tilted in, in the subcloud layer. And the fourth behavior, distance from the mid-level updraft. As the tornado becomes more uh, horizontally displaced from the main storm updraft, um, that's thought to be bad for a variety of reasons. Namely, um, wh when they're aligned, you probably get better upward uh, uh, directed perturbation pressure gradient forces that, that get really strong rising air, which is good for vorticity stretching. <clears throat> so all four of these behaviors use the tornado in the radar data, tracking it. And so uh, that's called the tornadic vortex signature. That's just the radar representation of a tornado. I've shown you several of them already. This is outbound. This is inbound. Uh, these are like 30 meters per second each. So really strong. It's, it's obvious there's a tornado here. And um, we can estimate the intensity of the tornado using the actual radial velocity. We take the sum of the max outbound and we add it to the max inbound. And you can actually directly, in an axisymmetric tornado, you can directly relate that to vertical vorticity. So it's a proxy for the tornado intensity. And we can also identify the center of the tornado. Okay, so a lot of very basic information we can get from, from our radar data. Well, where's the dual pole aspect come into play here? Remember I, I mentioned storm relative motion. Well, um, actually determining storm motion is very difficult. And uh, what we can do is track those ZDR columns I talked about, which were a proxy for the storm updraft. So here's a ZDR column at 1437 UTC, the same storm five minutes later. Here's where the ZDR column is. You can take the centroid and just do a simple algebra and estimate how far it moved over what period of time and get a really good estimate for storm motion, which we really couldn't do be before we had dual pole capabilities. What about the rapid scan <laughs> aspect? Um, well, here's the thing. We can't make the 88D scan faster. Uh, that's, it's set in stone how it operates for the most part. So what we did, instead of making the radar scan faster, is we made the tornadoes last longer. And we were able to do that in, in our database because we're starting with hundreds and hundreds of cases. So we only looked at long duration tornadoes, tornadoes that lasted at least 20 minutes or longer. That allowed us, and so with a radar that has five minute updates, that means we were getting our one, two, three, four looks at the tornado uh, before it dissipated. And we could see how it was changing leading up to dissipation. So we ended up with 36 cases. We started with a lot. Uh, but remember, we had a lot of restrictions here. We needed high quality data. We needed within 60 kilometers of one of the radars for four consecutive scans. And we really like to look at isolated cases to avoid the uh, storm mergers, which just screw everything up. So we ended up with 36, which is certainly a lot better than one or two. So what, what happened to these four behaviors uh, when we look at a larger sample of cases? So in these plots I'm going to show you, um, at the bottom here, you'll see like D, D minus 1, D minus 2, D. So what D means is that for all 36 cases, that's the last volume that a tornado was identified in. Right? The next volume, it was gone. So you can think about this as the dissipation volume. And then D minus 1 is one volume prior, two volumes prior, three volumes prior. All right? So as we're moving from left to right, we're going forward in time, leading up to tornado dissipation. So this is for TV, so this is for tornado intensity on the y-axis here. And what we see is that, yes, this is kind of a sanity check. As tornadoes are approaching dissipation, they are in fact getting weaker. All right? You can see the median here is about 32 meters per second. At earlier times, it's 55 or 60 meters per second. So this is uh, what we expected. In addition, on the right, this is volume to volume change. And so what we found is um, in 33 of our 36 cases, the tornado was in fact weakening as it was approaching its final volume, its last five minutes before it dissipated. However, in many other, at many other time periods, we saw that weakening as well. So you can already see this isn't going to be a slam dunk. 
It's not as easy as say, uh, uh, to say, the tornado's weakening, it's going to dissipate in five minutes. It's, it's not that simple, unfortunately. All right, so that's why we have our other behaviors. What do we, see? oh, okay, so this is just an example. Uh, these numbers just indicate the intensity, 79, 84, 80, then 62, 40, and then you can see it, the tornado's gone. All right, so that's our uh, tornado intensity. What about that storm relative motion? So these are polar plots, and I did a coordinate transform uh, relative to storm motion. So if you have a dot way out here, that means the tornado is moving forward of the storm. So if the storm was moving due east, the tornado was moving even uh, faster east. So forward, rearward, leftward, rightward, relative to the storm. If you're right in the middle here, that means the tornado was moving at an identical speed and direction as the storm. So what we see early on is that most of our tornadoes are moving so early in their life cycle. They're moving in a similar direction and speed to the storm. However, later on in the last volume before they dissipated, we see uh, a large majority of our dots have some rearward component to them. In other words, um, the tornado is not, so if you, for example, have a, a storm that's moving due east, our tornado is not moving as far due east as, as the storm is. Um, you can ignore the different colors for now. That's, uh, I'm not going to talk about cyclic tornado genesis today. OK, um, so here's an example. And so here's our, our, our tornado and our radar data, our TVS. And you can see in the first scan, it kind of moves off towards the northeast and then makes a beeline towards the north. Up is due north in this image. And so what's interesting here is that this storm was moving essentially due east. So you can see uh, in the first scan, it's kind of moving similar to the storm. But then as it begins to dissipate, um, it's moving due north with no eastward component while the storm is jetting off towards the east. So that's an example of our storm relative rearward motion. TVS tilt, this was an unexpected result. Um, TV, the tornado tilt was all over the place at all different times. It was large, it was small. Um, didn't matter what volume, what part of the life cycle we were in. It was highly variable. There was some signal that it was at least, even if it, the tilt was small, it was increasing <coughs> leading up to dissipation. But even that signal was pretty weak. So this was a whiff, uh, this third behavior. It just, when we moved to a bigger sample of storms, even though we had seen it in some case studies, didn't really hold up. And what about distance from the main storm updraft? Uh, what we did, this was a hit. So what we found is that um, in their final volume, tornadoes were displaced an average of about six kilometers from the main storm updraft. Whereas earlier in their life cycle, the average was more like three and a half, three and three quarters kilometers from the main storm updraft. In addition, in 28 of our 34 cases, even if the tornado was close to the updraft, it was at least moving farther away from the updraft as it was dissipating. All right, so there seemed to be a signal here as well. So here's uh, an example. Uh, this is our ZDR column. So this is our proxy for where our updraft is. And that's, uh, I just mapped it as the black dot here in the bottom. And our tornado center is the white dot. And so as we go forward in time from left to right, you can see that distance increasing from 5.5 to 8 to 9 to 11 kilometers. So this was a typical example of what we would see in our cases. The tornado, in fact, getting farther away from the main storm updraft. All right, so three of our four behaviors seem to have some signal associating, associated with tornado dissipation. However, as I showed you, especially for the intensity and some of the others, we also would see those individual behaviors at all times, even earlier in the life cycle of the tornado. So it may uh, be a little difficult to use in the actual warning process for a forecaster to say, oh yeah, that definitely means the tornado is going to dissipate in the next five minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, so what we were curious to do is to look at combinations of behaviors. And this was much more powerful. So yes, in any given volume, you would see maybe one of these dissipation behaviors. But we only tended to see <coughs> multiple dissipation behaviors at the time of dissipation. So the green here is uh, the number of cases with rearward motion. Uh, the red is weakening, tornado weakening. The purple here is large displacement. And the muted purple is when we see all three in our Venn diagrams. So you can see you know, 15 minutes before the tornado dissipated, 
zero cases had all three behaviors. Ten minutes before tornado dissipated, zero cases had all three behaviors. Five minutes before the tornado dissipated, 12 of our cases had all three behaviors. So now we felt like we were making some progress here where, okay, maybe a forecaster could actually have some confidence that they're seeing multiple dissipation behaviors that our tornado is going to dissipate. And um, you can define these in different ways. Uh, what does weakening mean? Uh, what displacement cutoff should we use? Many different ways to view this. Um, so for example, I can define things differently and get a higher probability of detection, but maybe a greater false alarm rate, uh, depending on how we define it. <clears throat> so uh, this was a paper that was published a few months ago in the Journal of uh, uh, Atmospheric uh, and uh, Meteorological Climatology, JMC. So, uh, and that was in 2019. Okay. So we believe this is kind of the first step uh, in terms of maybe eventually especially when you have a new radar network, identifying, ident uh, identifying uh, or developing a system that can be used in real time. So some other things that, that we've been working on with this climatology. So this is work that Chris Tuftadel has done, who just uh, defended his master's, is now a PhD student here. I mentioned how drop sizes were getting smaller leading up to tornado formation. But I only saw that in one case. Now we have our climatology. What do we find? Uh, and again, here's our one case where the drop sizes suddenly get very small, and then two minutes later, we get a tornado. All right. Um, why might this be? Um, I'm not going to get too much into the details here, but it's related to evaporation, where we think if you have a lot of small drops, that means you're having less evaporation, and you're influxing less negatively buoyant air, which means, uh, assuming the other conditions are ripe, that those are better conditions to get a tornado. If you have a lot of evaporation and negatively buoyant air, that's bad for getting a tornado. All right. So that's the idea behind that. The idea behind, you know, tornadic cases have small drops, and the, the drops are getting smaller, leading up to tornado formation. Uh, big problem is sample size, as I mentioned, and that, that's what this project was aimed to address. So instead of looking at one or two or ten cases, we're ideally looking at on the order of hundreds of cases to see if tornadic cases. Uh, storms have smaller drops than non-tornadic, and if drops are getting smaller leading up to tornado formation. So Chris looked at 68 tornado genesis cases. Here are the cases. So you can see our sample sizes are getting pretty high here. Right now we're getting something meaningful. Um, he did some storm surgery where he just looks at part of the storm, the hook echo that's near to where the tornado would form, at a, and he would look at the same height level for all, for all the storms and calculate things like ZDR and some additional polar metric variables, which I'm not going to talk about today. And so what did he find? Um, so these are 15-minute changes in ZDR leading up to tornado formation. And what he found is that decreases in ZDR were about twice as common as increases in ZDR. Okay, So not perhaps an overwhelming signal, um, but not necessarily inconsistent with our hypothesis. ZDR, de so drop sizes do tend to get smaller a majority of the time leading up to tornado formation. All right, so the, the, this is the number of cases. Uh, so to the left of this line are, are ZDR decreases. To the right are ZDR increases. And remember, we're using ZDR as a proxy for, for median drop size. What about tornadic versus non-tornadic drop sizes? Do we see smaller drops in non-tornadic cases? Uh, excuse me, in tornadic cases. So Chris also compared uh, using 60 some odd non-tornadic cases. So now tornadic and non-tornadic, we're at 130 cases. All right, so large sample. And what we found uh, was a bit of a whiff. Uh, we did not find obvious CDR differences between tornadic and non-tornadic cases, and we're trying to figure out why that might be. So what you're seeing in this climatology is some of the things we saw in case studies, we do see them in a larger sample of storms. But some of the things we would see in an individual case or two or three, we don't see it in a larger sample. And that's the entire point of this exercise. We don't know. <clears throat> I mentioned that we did see CDR decreases leading up to tornado uh, Formation, strangely, perhaps not. We also saw ZDR decreases leading up to what we call tornado genesis failure, which is when a storm gets really strong low-level rotation but doesn't produce a tornado. And so one possibility is that this decrease in drop size is more related to increases in low-level rotation um, rather than tornado formation specifically. Okay. So some other work. What about, so we talked about tornado, uh, 
the uh, TVS <laughs> anticipation. What about dual pole anticipation? So uh, Jake Segal, who's a master's student here, has been working on this project with me. And so we kind of took the converse and said, OK, our drop size is actually increasing leading up to tornado dissipation. That would mean more evaporation, more negatively buoyant air. That's bad for tornado maintenance. So maybe we see drop sizes getting larger before a tornado dissipates. And in fact, in some of my postdoc work, I found this did occur, but in three cases. Again, very small sample size. Uh, Jake also looked at that third signature I talked about, the ZDR arc. And that's related to low-level shear or a measure of shear called storm relative helicity. You can think about it as helical flow that's being ingested by the storm, which is thought to be good for tornado formation. And he wanted to know if that ZD arc magnitude was becoming lessened as the tornado was dissipating, because maybe the environment became less favorable. So uh, Jake's been analyzing 36 dissipation cases, uh, kind of doing, kind of taking the opposite part of the tornado life cycle as Chris took. And so what Jake found is that, um, yeah, in some cases, there's a ZDR increase to the right of this line. Uh, there's also a lot of cases where the ZDR decreases as well. There's not a strong signal here. So again, some of the things I found in my postdoc may have been the, res uh, the result of small sample sizes. Okay. He did find some interesting results using some of these other uh, dual pole variables, but you can, you can talk to Jake about that if you'd like. What about the ZDR arc? Um, I'm not going to go through how we define the ZDR arc. It's exhausting. Um, anyway, it's, it's right here, this part of the storm, where we have our enhanced ZDR. So did we see that lessen, that signature lessen, as we got closer to tornado dissipation because there was less vertical shear? Uh, looks like there's a signal there. So to the left means the ZDR arc got less well-defined. Its magnitude was lessened. And we saw that in about <coughs> two-thirds, or maybe almost three-quarters of cases, that's what we found, that the ZDR arc did weaken in magnitude leading up to tornado dissipation. Um, so I poo-pooed a lot case studies, right? Um, I have spent my entire career doing case studies up until I got to this point. Um, so the dual pole climatology is great for replicating kind of some of the dual pole things I talked about today, but maybe not rapid scan. Like I said, we can't make the AED network scan faster, right? And I'm not going to get into sales or mesosales. That's different. Um, it's going to have five-minute updates, maybe sometimes low-level two-minute updates. We're not going to get 10-second updates, not going to get 30-second updates. We're not going to be able to see the really nitty-gritty of tornado processes using this radar system. So I would argue that case studies are still extremely valuable. And in fact, I still work on them, um, especially when it comes to really short timescale tornado processes. That requires rapid scan data to be collected. And so there's lots of radar groups that do that. And they say, I don't have time to look at this here, analyze it. So here's a study I did with Katie McCown, who was an undergraduate here. Uh, she graduated in May and is currently a master's student at UNC Charlotte. And she did some terrific work analyzing a violent tornado and how it dissipated. I won't get into it today, but uh, we have a paper now in review. And so that's, that's really exciting. So case studies I, I continue to work on. So I don't want, want to give the idea that they're, they're not important, because they are. All right, so I'll end today talking about kind of the, the future of phased array radar and dual pole. Um, I'm showing this slide. Uh, one reason I'm showing it is because I showed the exact same slide uh, the first seminar I gave here in, on St. Patrick's Day 2014 when I was interviewing for this position. I showed the exact same slide. So we have this dual pole technology and the space array radar technology. I hope I've convinced you they're both great and they, they're both really important. So, but you notice I talked about them separately the entire talk. Um, be nice if we could have a polar metric, a dual pole, phased array radar, uh, a PP par. Um, unfortunately, the radar engineering, and I'm not a radar engineer, uh, but the radar engineering is a disaster. All right, so these two technologies do not play nicely with each other. You have tremendous uh, biases in your dual pole variables. And so that kind of stinks. And that leaves us with a bit of a conundrum, which is you know, some arguments about which technology is more important. Uh, for this type of weather versus that type of weather. And, um, you know, I, I, they're both important. So uh, when I gave my talk in 2014, I ended by saying, you know, I think this is going to be a really important the, um, 
issue to figure out in the next 10 or 15 years. And I kind of left it at that because I wouldn't be working on it. Well, I didn't know at the time that we'd be starting a radar program here uh, in the next couple of years and that we would actually be on the forefront of trying to deal with this issue. Um, and so uh, with, with the great work of, of Pablos and our relationship with Raytheon, we have a mobile radar called Skylar, which does have phased array and dual polarization capabilities in one system. So there's many different ideas about how to do this. Um, people much smarter than me. So for example, one idea is cylindrical phased array radar. I guess the geometry works out better. Um, so this is uh, an alternative attempt, uh, kind of, uh, much more cost affordable. We have a, a flat panel, uh, low power X-band phase phase system with dual polarization capabilities. So it's now mounted on a truck. You may have seen it in the South P lot. Uh, so some of the things I'm interested in is what will the quality of the dual pole data be? That's kind of always been the concern with these types of systems. And so I'm looking forward to doing inner comparisons in both types of warm and cool season type type weather. Um, and so uh, we actually got lucky at the beginning of September. This is a picture that, that Chris took of a water spout. And uh, the radar happened to be scanning during its testing phase and captured the water spout. So that's data that I'm going to be analyzing and looking at in terms of you know, how, how, does, how, how did the data look. What else can we do with, with, with the mobile radar in this part of the country? Uh, well, there's some pretty interesting areas in terms of tornadoes in the Northeast as well. So this is work I did with my first master's student, Matt Wanch, uh, where he looked, uh, there's not a lot of tornadoes in the Northeast. So that's all the red dots here. So it's hard to pick out areas and say, oh, that, that's a tornado hotspot. The sample size is just too low, right? It's not, it's not the Southern Plains, it's not Dixie Alley. So what Matt did is he took a different approach and he said, I'm gonna look at storm tracks. And what he found was that Storms that formed in western New York took a much longer time to produce a tornado than storms that produced tornadoes but formed in central or eastern New York. So that's what this is. Where the storm developed on the x-axis, how far it had to travel before it produced a tornado on the y-axis. And you can see the negative correlation here. All right, so this is another indication, even though we don't have a lot of storm reports, a lot of tornado reports, that storms are, when they hit the valley regions of New York State, hitting conditions that are more favorable for tornado development. All right? and, and this is probably because of uh, uh, channeling through the valleys. And, and um, it produces uh, better low level wind shear, which is good for tornadoes. Um, so we do have these areas. So uh, tornadoes, how they interact with terrain, how they interact with the marine influences are, are very interesting questions. And we can collect those type of data. It's still kind of difficult because it's hard to get a tornado when you're in the middle of Oklahoma. It's even harder to get a tornado in the Northeast, but that's one possibility. Uh, other uses of Skylar, we're using it right now in the NASA Impacts Project, looking at nor'easters, coastal winter storms, uh, the project that Brian is leading here. And so here's a picture I took of Skylar at, at the beach uh, on the truck, scanning, collecting data. Uh, we need some snow, though. This was last weekend, collecting data in the rain, the cold rain. It's great. Uh, so maybe we'll get some snow soon. So uh, just some, and uh, finishing up here, future work. Uh, Jake has his dissipation study that he's looking at. We have this climatology now, a bunch more things that I'd like to look at. Now that we have it up and running, I want to look at you know, that ZDR column, that proxy for the updraft, how that might relate to the tornado uh, life cycle. Comparison of these signatures and the near storm environment. And really putting it all together and say, yeah, forecasters might be able to use this information, or maybe not. Uh, field work. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there's this ongoing effort to uh, get funding to uh, take a bunch of radars and mobile mesonets and, and a bunch of other instrumentation and act as uh, an enhancer for impacts, a uh, ground-based enhancer for impacts called uh, Langostino, which is a proposed NSF project, limited area network of ground-based observation of snow bands and transition zones in nor'easters. Langostino. Um, and so we should be, so here's a, a, a mock-up of what deployment might look like with several radars. Uh, Cape Cod, I'm sure that would be a blast in the snow. Uh, but you get the idea and how it could uh, uh, complement uh, the impacts project going on for the next couple of years. So here's my summary. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through all of it. But we have this dual pole climatology. 
we're really excited about it. We think we've already made some, some great strides in, in um, maybe addressing some R2O problems. Maybe not right now, but especially with a new radar network in the coming 10 or 15 years, so to speak. At least get the science done so these types of real-time uh, now casting of tornado life cycles can be done. So with thanks to NSF and my research group, Jake, Chris, and now the graduated Katie, I'd be happy to take any questions. the operational um, side of things, now casting and all that. Um, is it, you mentioned the, the, the new network, is, is that going to be denser and, and is it going to be that the, you need, always need to be within like 60 kilometers? Yeah. Or once you work it out with these sort of, you know, by looking at 60 kilometers? So that's not, so it's not set in stone. Um, we know that we're going to have this current radar network at least through 2030. I suspect it might be longer than that. Um, and there's a lot of ongoing work as to what the next radar network would look like. So it's called WSR 88D, that's 1988. So it's getting, um, they future-proofed it to make it dual pole, which was brilliant to do at the time, but it's eventually going to get dated. So there's a lot of discussion of what the next radar network is going to look like. So some possibilities are that you make a breakthrough in dual pole phased array, and your next system kind of looks like our, like our current system in terms of the number of radars, but they're just dual pole phased array radars. Um, that would be great because you could leverage this type of information because you'd have much faster updates. You wouldn't have those five minute updates. You'd ideally have 60 second or 30 second updates where a forecaster could see these updates and see these types of tornado behaviors and say, okay, yeah, that tornado is probably gonna dissipate in the next five minutes. Uh, some alternative points of view are to have uh, a radar network and then kind of have smaller systems on cell phone towers. This is the idea behind the CASA project, where you fill in the gaps of radars. So you don't have, you don't need each radar to look out 200 kilometers. Yeah, you'll have your big radars and they can look out 100 kilometers. And then you'll have your smaller ones, low cost radars on cell phone towers um, that can kind of fill in the gaps between the big radars and do it in a cost efficient way. So there's still a lot of ongoing discussion of what the next radar network would, is, is going to look at. I'm sure it's going to be highly political, and it's going to be probably a little messy if I know how these things go. Um, but there's some time yet to, to, for that to happen. It's, it's going to be a while. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> you were arguing that, uh, that in terms of time dependence, that one didn't expect sudden changes, that there was a progression of alteration of properties. And, and yet it seemed to me in the untrained eye that I have that when you looked at patterns like your D1, uh, D minus 1, D minus 2, that in fact it did appear suddenly that the, that the major change occurred at the very final step. Yes. Uh, Can you talk about that? Sure. Yeah. So um, tornadoes, the, 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 what we would call the invective time scale of a tornado is 10 seconds. So tornadoes are evolving over very short time scales. The types of behaviors I'm looking at really aren't at those scales. So they're kind of more bulk quantities. How fast did the tornado move? You know, that's, that's not getting into the nitty gritty of the core flow of the tornado. So kind of the internal dynamics of the tornado are evolving over very short time scales, 10 seconds. The types of behaviors I'm looking at, um, I think are governed at, at slightly longer time scales such that we can see large-scale changes um, over a course of five minutes and essentially ignore kind of the small-scale changes that occur 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Um, certainly, and when we, I, I didn't show some of it, but I don't know if I have it here. I mean, some of the, some of the things we see with tornadoes, uh, I don't know if I can't do it. Yeah, um, so this is, this is an example. Uh, this is some data we collected. These are two tornadoes rotating around each other and then merging. So this had never been observed before and actually it hasn't been observed since. And the only reason we knew it is because we had this rapid scan data collecting every 10 seconds. So here's a tornado, here's a tornado. To the northwest and the southeast, they rotate around each other and merge. We found the storm chaser and he's like, yeah, that's what happened. Um, nobody had any idea. 
This whole process of two tornadoes merging and becoming one big tornado took 70 seconds. Now, our 88D network up updates every five minutes. It's hopeless. So there are certainly behaviors that we just can't see with our, our national radar network. The ones that I'm trying to identify are kind of larger bulk scale behaviors that are going to be identifiable, uh, that we can see large structural changes over 5, 10, or 15 minutes. So the question I, uh, I had is, um, you showed some very interesting relationships with some of these variables, and, but there were these you know, widespread in the DDR, for example, and there were some cases where the drops got larger, some were getting smaller. So in your opinion, what do we need to do to understand physically what's going on in these systems? understand yeah. it, and, and are we reaching a limit with just using radar alone to try to understand this or should we be combining this with other sure. things? Sure. Uh, so I think, uh, and, and I, I got a little bit to that with the dissipation stuff uh, when we started to get combinations of behaviors and I think that's the route you have to go. Um, so for example, uh, you talked about the drop sizes and, and so uh, one thing that, that I didn't have time to mention but I'll talk about it now is that okay, so maybe this is all true. The drop sizes get smaller, you have more positively buoyant air, and that's good for tornadoes. You need a bunch of other things to get a tornado. You need rotation to develop very close to the ground. You need this complex interaction between friction and, and vorticity vector. Um, crazy things have to happen that go beyond just, oh yeah, the drops got smaller and the air got warmer. So I think part of the reason why you see a signal, but it's, it's, it's there, but it's not terribly strong, is that these are really complex processes and it's only one part of, of the equation. So I think the best route forward is to establish all of these relationships and then see how they work in kind of a combined fuzzy logic approach, For example, uh, similar to how we deal with kind of hydrometeor classification. Um, maybe if we see three or four or five behaviors, then a forecaster can say, yeah, okay, I need to keep my eye out here. In addition to things like the near storm environment, what, um, yeah, I view this as in accordance with um, a lot of the things that are going on in terms of sh short time scale modeling. Uh, born on forecast, for example. I, I don't view this as, as against that. I, I think we can, uh, if forecasters have enough uh, time to look at all of this type of data, uh, to, it's all complimentary. Just one more question before I forget. Yeah, you, you emphasize sort of uh, observation and, and forecast, but have you worked with, uh, how, how has this kind of new uh, observations help model development in terms of uh, assessing how well our sure. models actually detect or simulate these tornadoes? Yeah, so a big thing now is developing uh, polarimetric emulators. So an ability to assimilate the dual pole variables and then let the model kind of handle what it's going to output in terms of microphysics. Um, that is not what I work on um, at all, and it's a little bit beyond me. But there is a huge effort now to leverage as, because obviously, um, you know, microphysics and models is a huge deal, and and it seems like uh, there absolutely should be a way to to make things uh, in simulations, whether it's for basic research or for for short time scale prediction, a lot better uh, by assimilating this type of data. And so the big thing there is, is, is emulators and being able to assimilate that data or output. Uh, so models can output ZDR and, and uh, especially that type of data now. Um, and th that work's been going on for a while now. And I, you know, I would say it's kind of lagging the observations, but um, I think there's been some progress made. Okay, great. Well, let's thank Michael again. Thank you.